All right. All right, well, good to be with you tonight. Um, I thought it would be interesting for uh, particularly our newer carvers to uh, have a little introduction to some painting techniques that we use in carving. And they, um, <clears throat> and uh, I chose to use acrylics because that's what most of us use. There are some uh, advantages to using acrylic paints and some disadvantages. Uh, as opposed to oils. Uh, the, the advantages are that it's, uh, it's quick drying, um, <clears throat> so you can, um, you can paint over the top of it quickly. It's, um, uh, it's easier to use than, than oils if you're, if you're new to painting techniques. It doesn't, doesn't take quite the, the skill set. Uh, oils have the advantage of being um, a little more intense color. Uh, they stay wet longer, allows you to work the, the blending and that longer, but, uh, but then um, uh, that drying time is the big issue with, with oils. So most uh, of us find that acrylics are the way to go. And they come in, uh, in various types, uh, depending on the brand and, and what the, uh, the maker is trying to achieve. There are, um, there are acrylics that are straight out of the bottle. Uh, okay. And uh, that's, that's ready to use uh, it right, right out of the bottle. So uh, a lot of chroma and Liquitex and, and some of them you can get that. Uh, most, uh, I find it most useful to, to use tubes. You can get either a heavy body uh, like this Windsor and Newton uh, and you can feel that it's it's a stiff paint as you work the uh, the tube, or uh, one that's more of a just a, a thin um, paste-like consistency in these Josonia, which are the um, the ones that I use the most. It's a chroma product, but it has kind of a, um, a satin or matte finish. Uh, which gives you less sheen than the um, than Liquitex or some of the other brands. Um, using acrylics, I, I find that I need at least a few um, uh, things that modify it a little bit, and the principal one is flow medium. What that is is it's a, a surfactant which breaks down the, uh, the tensile um, uh, characteristics of the water and, and it allows it to flow uh, more evenly into uh, whatever you're painting. And so particularly for blending, that's an important uh, additive. And usually we just use a couple of drops of that in the mix of paint that we, that we put together. There are things like retard medium and, and some other things that, uh, that you can use as well. But those are the uh, the uh, principal thing is is to have that. Uh, some sometimes if you want a little more sheen and you're using a flat based uh, paint like the Joe Sonia, you can add um, a water based um, satin varnish to it, and that will just amp up the the sheen a little bit, but without making it really shiny uh, and looking fakey. Um, some of you folks who carve caricatures will also um, somehow, and I have no idea since oil and water don't mix, will figure out a way to, to use uh, linseed oil um, to, to do that. And then somebody else will have to tell you how to do that. So that's, that's the basics on the paints. Um, brushes, there are, a couple of different ones, um, different types of brushes that I use. One is, uh, is a stiff bristle brush. This one's for uh, a larger surface and, uh, and a little smaller. And then a round um, filbert brush that is used particularly for uh, dry brushing. And we'll talk about that technique and how to use that brush. And you'll, you can watch me use it. Uh, as we go on, but those are the bristles, a stiff bristle brush. 
brushes, and they're generally um, not very expensive. They're they're uh, made out of hot bristle. Mm -hmm. The the other brushes that I use are um, are just um, ones with a, a hair. How you doing? Uh, bristled in them, and it does. Yeah, you plugged in the white cord. Stop white cord. Does all. Well, figure out who needs to mute. Okay, so um, um, they come in basically two types of, of hair or bristle, and uh, one of the synthetics and natural. Uh, natural goes everything from squirrel to. Uh, Kolinsky mink, <laughs> which is uh, the most expensive option uh, that comes out of out of Russia, and they uh, they produce fifty dollar to sixty dollar brushes out of that, or even more, depending on the size. Uh, there are imitations out of it, out of out of sable and other things that uh, that go into good quality brushes, and sometimes they'll mix different uh, ones together. Um, the principal synthetic that is used, and you can see it kind of in this lighter colored shader that I'm holding up here, is, uh, is Taclon. And, um, and then um, as far as brands, uh, there are several good brands. Um, Low Cornell puts out a good brush. Jack Richardson, <clears throat> if you want to pay the price, Princeton, um, uh, Windsor and Newton are all good uh, good quality. The thing that you want to be sure of is that if you're going to be doing any fine detailed work, that it, that the brush will come to a fine point at the end of it. Uh, some of them will kind of be squared off, so you want a round brush that will point up and, and come to a, a sharp tip when you get it wet by just uh, running it between your lips and see if there's a good point on it. Don't do that in the store. Um, <laughs> so the sizes that I use, I, I like uh, this. Um, this is a number 10 shader. And um, generally I'll try to get a six up there as my largest brush that I'll use for most applications. And I'll go down to about a three then and then to uh, maybe I'll have a three and a two, and then I'll go down to um, aughts, and I've got one that's clear down to five aught, uh, and that little guy <laughs> right here is is what I've been using a lot lately for getting uh, the ends of feathers out onto uh, a different colored surface, uh, and and so those are the uh, the brushes. And so that's pretty much it for materials. Um, you got to use have some water, of course, for rinsing your brushes. You can also add a little bit of um, uh, Windex. Ammonium is is a solvent for um, acrylics, and so the Windex has a little bit of ammonium in it, and that can help clean your brushes a bit too. Uh, for final cleanup, you can. Uh, I know Clee Taylor recommended uh, Murphy's Oil Soap, and, and that's a good cleaner. But uh, just rinsing your brush in, in uh, water is generally okay while you're using the, uh, the brushes. Okay, um, let's, uh, let's stop for a minute and just ask if there are any questions on, uh, on supplies, either paints or brushes. So I don't see any questions in the chat. Does anyone have one they want to unmute and ask real quick? Okay. Can everybody hear us? Yes. All right. Then we'll just go go ahead and uh, and move on to the next uh, step, which is we'll talk a little bit about uh, surface preparation. Um, <clears throat> for a lot of carving. It works really well to use just plain bare wood. Uh, that has the advantages of, the, of you being able to let the paint soak in and penetrate the wood and uh, use thin washes to build it up. Uh, and uh, the paint goes on to wood really well. It adheres well to it. 
And so just raw wood is, is a great way to paint some things. The disadvantage is that with acrylics particularly, uh, because it's a water-based paint, it will raise the grain slightly. And so if you're trying to achieve something that's got really fine detail in that, sometimes that will, uh, uh, that will be an issue. But generally, um, for caricature carving and, and uh, other, um, a lot of other applications, you can just go ahead and paint on bare wood. If you're going to be applying quite a bit of color over it and basically trying to hide the fact that it's wood, then you probably want to uh, seal the, the uh, wood with, um, with a finish. And I use Deft, which is um, a synthetic la lacquer. And uh, it, it uh, seals the wood, makes it so that the paint doesn't penetrate, and it uh, lays the grain down so that uh, so you don't get it rising up on it. Um, so I'm going to show you just uh, very quickly how to um, how that comes out with the uh, with a couple of different surfaces. So th this is just bare wood, and um, so I'm just going to wet it to begin with. And um, I'm just applying some water to it. You want it to be wet, but not uh, water, standing water on it, because um, that will thin your paint out too much. But you, um, you do want a little bit of water on there. And I'm just going to take one of my paints, whatever color. And I'll wet my brush and just get a real thin, uh, this is wet on wet application. And that's just painting a black wash onto the, onto the surface. Now, this surface that I've just painted is sanded. And generally, you do not want a mix if, if you're trying to achieve uh, the same effect over the surface of your carving. You don't want a sanded surface and a blade applied surface because they, they will show up a little differently. Notice how much deeper the, these are both bare wood, but notice how much deeper the, the penetration on the sanded surface over here versus what you got over here where the blade kind of burnished this from my uh, from my sweep, and so um, so that's why you don't want that um, combination. Uh, it, it should either be sanded or not sanded, depending on the effect that you want to achieve. So hang on a second. Okay, I, we're just pausing here a minute. It signed me out because I signed in on here. Oh, okay. I signed in on here to. Uh, to make sure everything was working right. Because since I'm signed in on here, you can't be signed in on the device itself. So. Okay. And see what happened that way. recording. Here's a tech on the tools that can back up behind it. So we're still, still recording. Okay. We're back. Okay. Um, had a little interruption there. We were trying something else, but um, that that gives you just a, a little background. Now, a, a pose, as opposed to bare wood, this is uh, this little folk art fish is um, is a sealed piece, and uh, and so I've uh, I've applied a coat or two of deft thinned with uh, lacquer thinner 
to this to seal the surface and provide a uniform uh, paint base on it before I'll, I'll start the painting. Jim had said that it would be helpful if we were closer, so that's why I moved the camera down. Then. Oh, if okay. it's in your way, we can move it back. All right. All right, so mostly I do bird carvings, and, uh, and so uh, all of those I seal with deft. And I've got a little feather here that we're going to be working on uh, in a few minutes that, uh, that has been sealed with deft. From there, um, we move on to gesso and base coats. Um, gesso is a chalky-like paint that promotes adherence uh, and it has uh, uh, it also provides a, a uniform color or ba painting base for what you're going to um, be working on. Doug, I'm going to ask a question from yes. the chat. Dave says maybe I missed it but are you using the small lidded containers to keep thin paint to use? Yes, I mix, I pre-mixed my paints for this demonstration, and that's why they're in these little lidded containers. So the one that I, I just filled is, uh, is my gesso. And for applying the gesso, I will use um, the stiff bristle brush uh, and, um, and apply it over, over a large surface uh, on, this, on this fish. So, you generally don't want to thin gesso because it um, it doesn't adhere as well. And and if you use the stiff bristle brush, it's not really going to do it uh, too much to fill your texturing. It's it's texturing, of course, is not an issue on this fish because it's not a it's just a folk art fish anyway, and so it's, it doesn't have all the little fine details on it like burned in um, scales and things like that, like a real fish carver would do with, with, uh, with his work. But, but um, for this little folk art fish, this is good enough. And you just apply it and brush it out so that it, um, gives you a fairly thin coat. And you can see that that, that gives you a nice clean uniform colored surface to um, to work with. I'm only going to do one half of this fish right now to um, to get us started. As I get up around the eye, I could go ahead and coat it and some people do that and then just just uh, scrape the paint off the eyes later, but I like to be a little more careful. So I will use one of my regular brushes to do the, the remainder of the, of the head. I would imagine that uh, um, most of you would not use gesso on bare wood. I, I may be wrong, there may be applications where you would use that, but I, I have never found that to be a particular advantage because it, it, will, uh, it will take away the, the wood show through that you usually want just a little bit of on a, on a carving that, that you're doing so that it shows that it's wood and not a, um, not a resin cast. All right, we got that guy now covered. Now I'm going to uh, just apply a little gesso to my feather. And again, I'll use a stiff bristle brush because this one does have finer um, texturing. Question from the chat, Doug. What's the difference yes. between gesso and normal paint primer? Uh, the gesso is, as I say, has a, a kind of a chalky substance in it. And so it's, it's always, um, you can get it actually in different colors. Uh, you can get brown and, and black, but it's, it's basically designed to give you a, a, a coat of, um, of something that will take the layers of paint that you're going to use uh, 
better than, than if you use just a regular paint or just a sealer. So you can see that I'm brushing these out now right in the direction of the, the feather barbs so that, uh, so that I don't fill in those, that texturing. And that's why I'm using a stiff bristle brush because it cleans that, that paint right out of those uh, but still gives me the, the adherence that I want. And I've made the texture a little deeper than I normally would on a, on a bird in this feather because I want to use it later to show some dry brushing techniques. And, and so, uh, all right, so we've brushed it out of most of those grooves in the feather. Larry Wade from Portland says, how long does it take gesso to dry? And do all brands of gesso dry about the same? Um, I, I think so. And, it, and again, it's just, you know, it's just a water base. So uh, it, unless there's a buildup someplace down in a crevice, it, it, it'll be ready to use within, uh, within about two minutes. So you're using liquid gesso, is that correct? Yeah. You can get thicker gesso, is that correct? Yes, I think there are some consistencies. This is a Liquitex. Uh, Joe Sonia puts out one. Um, so I, there, there are various um, brands, but they, they all work about the same. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the, the one issue is that um, you generally don't want to um, thin it. If you do thin it at all, it's better to use um, the flow medium rather than water. Okay, I'm just gonna do the quill down here now and we'll be done with the gesso. Okay. So we'll just set that aside to dry. And um, so Larry's question about the drying time probably depends on the type you're using. Yeah, it might, but I, I, I I've never had a, a, a gesso that didn't dry within about uh, within about a minute and a half. And again, uh, the you know. For my, for my regular paints, I use a hair dryer to dry them. But, um, but if you try to do that with the gesso, it, it sometimes will crackle. So it's generally recommended that you let it air dry. Let's see my fish now. Um, yeah, that's, that's dry and ready to paint. So, so that one uh, is ready to go. On your on your camera, this is right in the middle of the screen, right there. Okay, all right, good, because that's what I'm going to use next. Now, uh, any question? Any other questions on the gesso or or anything that we've done so far? Larry Wade asks if you forgot to clean your gesso brush, how long before you ruin your brush? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's uh, the acrylics. <laughs> uh, you you've got to rinse your brush pretty quickly, but don't ever leave your brush standing in your, your water tank <laughs> uh, or in liquid and because it's, um, it's really hard on the brushes. It'll, it'll bend the, uh, the ends of them out and, and you just don't want to do that. So, so um, yeah, make sure that you, um, that you clean your brushes fairly quickly after use. Um, and, and that's just with the water. Uh, you, you know, uh, you can come back later and do the, um, do the final cleanup with, with um, Murphy's oil soap or, or uh, Windex, but, but for the uh, time that you're painting, you're fine with just that. Okay. Um, Let's 
let's uh, do a, a few more little washes on this um, on this bare wood because I just want to demonstrate something that will uh, will allow us to have it nice and dry by the time we get to where we want to use it. So I'm going to put uh, some water and um, oh, you're off screen. Screw down just a little bit. There you go. Okay. I'm just adding some water here to my uh, to this to get a really thin wash. And this is just carbon black. Okay. And I'm just going to paint this. Uh, whoop, I forgot that. Forgot to wet my surface first. All right, now I'm going to apply a, a very light coat, very thin wash of just this black and I'll clean most of it out. And you can see now on this that there's uh, quite a bit of wood color still showing through. Okay, and let's say that we want to shade this a little bit so that toward the edges of this thing that is sort of like a beard, we'll come back and put another wash on. And notice that because it's, uh, it's wet, that surface is wet, that we're getting uh, a soft transition there. And come back with just plain water and feather out those edges. So see, now you've got a dark uh, place in the part that you want to be a shadow. Uh, that's the deepest and it lightens up as you come out onto the uh, onto the upper surface. I'm going to put one more coat over the entire thing and that will be it for this application. It's still wet with my wash. Thin that out with water. Okay, now I'm going to set that aside to dry. While I start demonstrating the next technique, but are there any questions uh, up to this point on, on the washes? I'm going to use more of them. Uh, in painting the fish, so so you'll get a chance to um, to have a look at that again. But that's um, that's the basic technique. All right. No questions. Moving on. We'll put that aside then. Just clean that out a little bit. All right, that's, now I'm going to um, show you some blending technique with, um, for soft color transitions. And let me give you, uh, before I actually start painting the fish, 
Uh, let me just show you how it looks on the finished product. Question popped up in the chat today. Okay. It says, how much do you thin the paint? Is that a formula or is that just an eyeball? It's, uh, it really depends on what effect you're trying to get. Sometimes, generally, um, um, most of the applications that I use, I like to use a minimum of two and up to five washes. And so if you're gonna, if you're fairly confident it's not heavy, uh, heavily textured or something that you need uh, a lot of uh, fine detail on to t where you're trying to preserve the texture, um, I, I will go with a, with a fewer washes and get more intense color buildup quickly. But if it's, um, if it's something that's going to, um, to take a, a much longer, um, a, a lighter buildup, then, uh, then I'll thin it way down and just add more washes until you get the, but that's one of the advantages of washes is that you, it allows you to um, achieve the, the color depth or the intensity that you want. You're controlling that because you're controlling it. Whereas if you just go straight with the, with a, a creamy mixture of paint, you you're there with the color that you're going to end up with, and the wash you can just keep adding it until you get the right intensity. Okay, this is what we're going to try to do on on the on the fish, is get this transition between the upper gray area, uh, greenish gray area of the fish and the lower white belly, okay? So, um, so we're gonna demonstrate that next. So I will start off again the, the same way by just um, wetting the surface, even though this one has been gessoed, I'm still going to wet the, wet the whole surface on it. Larry in the chat says, for the fish, if you get gesso on the eye, can you get it off after it dries? Yes. Yeah, you just scrape it off with a wet toothpick. If the gesso goes on too thick and dries, can it be sanded or otherwise be thin? Um, generally, you would not want to. I think you. I think you'd scratch the eyeball. Yeah, yeah, you certainly don't want to do it on the eye. Okay, so I'm going to put this wet surface over the whole thing, and um, and I'll come back and wet the transition area again in a minute. But for right now, that's probably enough. Okay, and because I've got a, a fairly large surface here, I'm going to use my shader and I'll, I'll wet the brush first. I've already got a wet surface and now I'm going to dip it in my gray paint and come down from the top. Notice how thin that wash is. And I'm brushing it out so that we get the, okay. Need a hair dryer. No. Okay, so we're keeping it wet. And now I'm going to come over here to my white and bring it up from the opposite direction, up into that, and then rinse the brush and go back and forth, just like that. Okay. Now that you can, uh, that's almost imperceptible because we're using a very thin wash. Actually, it would be good to have a hair dryer. <laughs> because you do definitely want it to dry before you, um, before you apply the next wash. That's fine. Thank you. Eric's going to get me set up here with a, with a hairdryer so that we can do that. Okay. And then I'll come back with a, um, when Doug goes to use the hairdryer, I'll, I'll mute so you don't have to hear the, 
noise. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just getting up right here around the eye a little bit. And that wash was a little thicker. So I'm going to thin it out some. And see, on a sealed surface like this, I can do that. If it were bare wood, um, I wouldn't be able to. And I'm going to get this area up around the mouth where there's kind of transitions to white as well and around the edge of the gill. Okay, so now I'm going to just quickly dry that. And we'll come back with another wash. This time, my wash is thin enough that I think I'm not going to uh, bother to, to wet it, except at the transition point. Too far. There you go, I think. OK. So I'm down that far. Now I'm going to rinse my brush and wet this along the wet this along the uh, the transition line again, and then come up with the white. Thank you for keeping me. Okay. All right. And then once again, we're going to just kind of go back and forth. Now my, my transition point is up a little too high. So I'm going to bring some, some down a little lower. And that brush is a little too large for my blending, so I'm going to switch to another one. Go over it a couple of times. Wind chime sound while you're painting. Yeah. And you want to watch and try to make sure that you don't get any uh, hard lines on on this. Um, so use a little water at the edges. Now, where I've only painted half of this fish, I don't want that hard line. So I'm just going to kind of feather that color out so it'll blend in when I paint the other side of it. But you can see now we're starting to get the kind of effect that we want on there. So I'm just going to dry that one more time.
Now you see if we've used two so far, I'm gonna wet that line again where the transition takes place. And this time I'm gonna put a little heavier coat on. Thank you, Allison. Have a good night. She's having a bug out. Okay. A good amount of time. So she watch the rest of it on YouTube. Yeah. All right. Rinse the brush. Bring it right up along to wherever that line is. I'll try a softer brush on this this time. And I've done it from one direction and now I'm going to try it from the other. What color are you using, Doug, on the top part of the fish? It's, um, yeah, the, the mix is um, pine green, raw umber, and nimbus gray uh, is, is what I used for that to try to approximate Trump. Nimbus gray, pine green, pine green, raw umber, raw umber, nimbus green, nimbus gray, gray. Sorry, that's a new color for me. Now I'm just going to highlight this, the edges of the gills. A little bit, and remember, you know, I'm just doing a folk art fish here, so this, I'm not going to have to be real accurate or careful about it. And we'll put a few, some of our gray down here on the, on these, and we can just paint them directly as long as we stay in the lines. And that's a hard edge, notice, on that fin. So we're just painting straight onto it without putting water because you don't want it to flow on up onto that white belly. All right. All right, I'm going to set that fish aside now and, um, and just leave it like that for right now and let it dry well while we work on the feather. Now, um, this feather is... Um, this is a feather from an extinct bird. Um, so, so it's not one that you will have seen before. I'm just gonna go straight onto the, onto um, the surface of it up here with some burnt sienna.
And I'm going to transition down into uh, some white down here. You know, let us get down and extinct bird. <laughs> <laughs> and so now that we're getting close, I'll wet that surface between the two. And I'll come into it with my burnt sienna from one side. Rinse the brush. I'm told that Jerry Simchek um, for this kind of operation will has a way of holding two brushes in his hand so that he doesn't have to keep rin rinsing in between. Can you see the nice soft transition that that develops rather than uh, rather than a hard hard line between those those two colors? We'll intensify this one up here a little bit more with another wash. And now I'm going to put some black up on that upper surface because I'm going to do something with it. And I'm just painting straight onto it until I get down to the transition zone. And black to white is really a hard transition because it's, uh, there's such hugely contrasting colors. But if you work at it a bit, you can get it. I'm going to put a little white tip on the feather too. or at least a gray one. And then we'll, we'll give him a black quill. So I'll just bring some of that black on up onto the quill with a smaller brush. And we'll transition it down into the white on the on the quill. And bring it on up into there. Okay. And put a little more white out on that tip. All right, now just blend this down in a little bit more. So that we go from white to gray. And we'll set that aside and come back to our fish. The fish needs <clears throat> at least one more coat of that uh, of that dark above. The white, because we were painting over a white gesso, doesn't really even need any more. But we want a fairly heavy paint buildup on this fish because uh, we want a uniform color. <clears throat> on that back. So it's only down here at the transition point that I'm going to 
play around a little bit more with my blending. All right, that should be just about enough for that. I'll add one more coat to the fins. Y'all can't see it, but Doug has a smile on his face because he's painting a fish. <laughs> All right. So using those techniques, you can see now we've got this, this fairly soft transition between the, the white belly and the, the, the white belly and the, the gray upper of the fish. And, um, you know, I can continue to apply, apply more washes until I get that uh, a really nice uniform color, which I probably will do at some point, but I'm not going to mess with that right now because I want to move on to the uh, to the next stage. Is there any are there any questions about uh, about any of those steps up to that point? Okay. Well, what you can do is. Um, using those techniques, you can get some pretty amazing realism and, and uh, transitions in colors. Um, so that, for example, on this feather, there's, um, notice these, the, the soft transition from the, uh, the kind of smoke pearl color or white down here into a gray and here even into a black and then uh, we're going to try a little of this iridescence up here and even a, there's a little bit of a softness on the transitions between the the black and the white here and the gray and the white so those are uh, those are what you're trying to achieve on that feather and then um, over here You can see how using those same techniques, you can even get effects like that on a on this apple, where it's going from green into a yellow into a red. With different highlights. Okay. For the harder line painting, where you're trying to just follow a, a specific line, and this character carving is not my thing, but I wanted to bring this one to demonstrate something else. You'll just go, of course, right along the lines. And, uh, and there you don't want that, uh, one of the surfaces, you don't want to be wet because it will bleed out into, into it. But, um, but you can still wet the surface that you're painting and use washes. Marty asks, can you show the feather again? <clears throat> yeah. 
Let's see, I think you want to, oh, this one. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah that's a, a mallard uh, speculum <laughs> feather. Okay. So wash you start with, is it diluted tin water to one paint? Um, that's a little thinner than I generally use. I would say probably five to one. Five water, one water uh, to, to this Joe Sonia paint. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, any other questions before we move on to uh, dry brushing? All right. Well, I think that's dry enough. And how you test my blown on it? <laughs> Just giving it a little extra blow. <laughs> All right. Dry brushing is um, particularly effective for for highlighting edges and. Um, And for um, also putting an overlay of a different color over over a, one that you're you're already using. Um, what I'm going to use here is a, a filbert, and generally I use the the, um, the paint right out of the tube, so it's really nice and thick. I didn't bring some white with me, so I'll have to use this. But then after getting the paint on it. Dap it onto the onto a paper towel like that until you've got almost all the paint out of it. And at that point, go across the grain and look what's happening to that bin. Can you see how it accentuates the detail? I spilled over a little onto my uh, onto my fish, but that's okay. We can easily cover that up or wash it off. So I'm gonna do the same thing down here on the tail. Just going across the texture What do you do if you put too much on it, though? Um, you, you can kind of wash it off. Finger. As long as it's, uh, as it's still wet. But particularly on the edges, it's, it's, uh, it, it creates a really nice effect. Steve asks, is the brush called a filbert? I said, yes, yes. filbert. Uh, put them along these bottom fins too. And see what was before just a, a plain old gray surface there. Now you, you can see the, uh, the highlights on it. And I'm going to paint a little bit up here on the gills too. Notice I, I can lighten up a place that I got to Too dark up here. Okay. And I use dry brushing a lot and for, for many different things. What I'm going to do is put one more coat of that um, sienna on my feather and dry it. This time I'm going to go fairly heavy. Steve, uh, Jim asks, is the extinct feather from a pinto bird made from tater wood? <laughs> <laughs> Most likely. Okay. Let me get my 
black here, a little heavier right in the middle too. To your right a little more. All right, let me get that good and dry. All right, now I'm going to do um, a little more dry brushing on this feather. And the first thing I'm going to do is just take some yellow oxide or uh, raw sienna, raw sienna, and um, just squeeze it right out of the tube onto my, onto my filbert. And then dab it off. Particularly around the edges. So we're down to just a very thin coat of it on there. And then I'm going to go over the Ross at the um, the burnt sienna with a raw sienna. And see what that did um, is it, it left the, the burnt sienna, the darker color, down in the, in the grain uh, of the, uh, or the, the direction of the, uh, of the feather barbs. But it, uh, it caught the, just the top of it. I'm going to lighten it up even a little more out here toward the edge. And that that reveals the texturing on your on your bird a lot more than just uh, having one single color on there. Okay. So I'm going to do the same thing with now just to, uh, to highlight this gray area down here where the white transitioned into it. And see that helps also with that transition of the of the color from the white to the to the gray. Now, as a final step on the feather, what I'm going to do is um, take some iridescent green. And um, I'm just going to take a little bit of yellow oxide And go over the 
center portion of that and lighten up that black. Okay. Well, it's just barely perceptible, but there's a little bit of yellow oxide in there. Now let me get that good and dry. And then I'm going to apply a little bit of iridescent green, again, using the dry brushing technique. Got to be some in there somewhere. You can say a little bit, you need a little bit. Don't you? There it is. Once again, dab most of it off. And then we're just going to go over that little area right in there. Again, running across the direction of the. The texturing and the feather. You see how that's coming up now to give us that. Iridescence. I hope that's showing up as green, is it? Yep. Okay. So that is, uh, that's basically what I had planned to cover tonight, except for uh, a final. Um, thing that I just wanted to mention on uh, putting a transparent protective coat over the uh, over the final product and that is a choice you can either leave it just the way it is um, the early instruction that I got on caricature carving by the way just let me point out how uh, on this little caricature carver carving how um, the highlight has come up on the on the hat and, and uh, the worn area on his shoes and that's all done with dry brushing okay so more more of that dry brushing and if we were to do it uh, on this beard uh, we would go across it this way in the eyebrow and we would get uh, a similar effect on that I'm not going to take time to do that. Anyway, what I, what I um, have used generally on the character carvings, just to seal them and, and uh, provide a little bit of a protective service, is to use the uh, refined linseed oil. Um, and I'll just paint it on there and, and let it soak in uh, on top of the acrylic paint. And it kind of intensifies the color just a little bit. Um, and uh, and then kind of wipe it off so that you don't have any excess on it. For the um, for bird carvings, I like I've uh, learned about this spray lacquer testers dull coat, and it it um, produces a. a you, you really cannot see any additional sheen or change in color on it. So, um, so I really like to use it and it's just a spray lacquer and you put a thin coat of that over the top of everything 
and you've got your uh, um, a protective coat so that if, if people handle the carving, it's not going to get skin oils and things like that destroying the, the painted surface. All right, that pretty well wraps it up. I, uh, I hope that's been useful to at least some of you. Larry uh, probably would be able to add a lot more and on, on uh, bird carving and what he likes to do. There's a whole other dimension here that I have not dealt with, which is uh, um, airbrushing uh, with thinner paints yet. And, uh, and he's found a, a new uh, paint variety that he likes even better than the Josonia. If he wants to comment on that, he can. And of course, Eric is, is the expert for, uh, for this and Larry both more, more than I am, uh, uh, much more than I am, because I uh, only do those under uh, duress and with instruction. But Larry, for, for Larry, the others, we'll, uh, we'll let you comment or questions. Larry Wade has a question. It says, how long can you keep your small painting cups open before the paint can't be, can't be used? Uh, occasionally, I do have to add a little a drop of, um, generally after I've mixed the paint to the consistency I want, rather than, um, than thinning it with water, I will come back and just put a drop in, and before putting them away, very often I will just take a, a drop of uh, the flow medium and, and put it in the container and then, uh, and then cover it up. But for, for something like this, uh, generally I can get through uh, an hour of painting or so with, before the paint starts to dry out too much if it's in a, a fairly contained um, thing like this. I, usually I'll use one of those pallets with the, um, with the depressions in it, the little cup pallets, and put film can covers over the top of my paints each time I finish using a particular color. So the floor is now open for questions. If anybody has comments or questions they want to either put in the chat or unmute and speak. Thank you, Doug. Longer. What's that? Thank you, Doug. I appreciate the, the demonstration. All right, well, I hope it was useful. <laughs> okay, I think I'll sign off. Good night, folks. See you, back. The, the airbrushing, this is Larry, I'm in the dark. Uh, the airbrushing will be a whole different ball game. And, and if there are some folks who would like to do that, I would be happy to give what little information I know about that. Uh, <clears throat> the, the only thing that I would add uh, to the other Larry, Larry Wade, uh, the wet palette that you can purchase and you don't have to purchase them, you can make your own. But that wet palette uh, really works. And it I've had paint stay in there two or three weeks uh, with a wet palette that that uh, is, you know, that, that's about all I ever do anymore when I'm doing, you know, when I'm doing painting, especially on the caricatures, is, is the wet palette. And Doug alluded to that. Um, you ask how long the paint uh, lasts. That's I can get it. I can get three weeks out of it without any trouble at all. Yeah, that's that's good. Steve says thank you very much, Doug. Great job. Pleasure. I enjoy doing this. Well, Doug, I, I enjoy watching you and and. I actually learned, I love watching you do your air, your dry brushing. That's that's always been kind of a mystery to me. And that was very helpful. Thank you very much. Good. And I need to go, I need to go feed animals. So I'm gonna bail also. So okay. uh, we'll, we'll talk with you later. Bye. My pause. Okay. Okay. And thank you, and I'm going to sign off too. Thanks a lot. That was great. Well, thank you. It went longer than I expected, but uh, I hope it was okay. No, you got you covered a lot of good stuff. Yeah, I will... get to Larry. Go ahead. Oh, Larry, go ahead. Larry. Yeah, great job. I really appreciated that. I do 
have a question for either you or Eric about the camera, second camera setup that you've got. Is that a phone or a separate camera in the holder? How no, I'm Larry. I'm a cheap phone guy. I think I have a hundred dollar phone. I have a. I have. Let me let me pull it up here. I have two cameras. One's on a tripod that's looking at Doug, and it's a JS webcam JVC that I bought from Best Buy. And then the one that's that's overhead is a Logitech HD webcam. I switch those back and forth because one of them is has great resolution when you pull away from it but not up close and the other one has great resolution really up close and not so much far away so i have them okay. mounted on a homemade device that i have with a device that i got from office depot office max whatever it's called it has a halo light let me point let me point it out to you it has a halo light and a camera so there's the camera right there it's mounted in a in a in a spring loaded device and then there's the halo light right there all of these okay. run all of those run through usb cords into a splitter that you see right here the splitter goes it has a power on the back right here and then it has a a, a plug-in that goes from here to the computer and then every other input device fits in here and you can switch back and forth that way um took me a while to figure out figure that out and you can switch back and forth by clicking on the camera down at the bottom where it says video and it allow you to switch cameras. Yeah. Does that help? It does. Yeah. My I'm daughter's a teacher. My daughter's a teacher. She's been using a document camera in her, in her classroom and I've been using that for teaching carving and it works out, but I like the, the overhead arrangement that you've got, uh, up and out of the way. It seems like that's a really great, great solution. Well, over the years of my YouTube videos, I've, changed what i've done for a while i had a gopro and then i found out that after using it a while i can't see what i'm doing because the gopro doesn't have a screen that you can monitor so i have a camera that would fit on a tripod over my shoulder and then i built a thing that was kind of an awkward angle i built a device where i could hang it right above the table and that worked for a while and now i'm into the webcams because i think that i think the resolution is a little bit better yeah that's easier to use too i'd love to I'd love to hook up my camera directly to the computer and use it that way, but it, it never recognizes it as an input device. So, yeah. Well, Doug, you made it look so easy. I'm sure it took a lot of preparation to do all that. So thanks. <laughs> thanks, for doing, th thanks for sharing. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, what's my pleasure. Saying, what's that old saying about being a 40-year-old, 40 40-year 40 overnight success? <laughs> that makes it look easy, but I can tell you it's not yeah. watching it from this end. Yeah, I know. Right. Thank well, you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to sign off. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, you too. Doug, last parting words? Get out there and paint. I want to I want to thank Doug for doing this. I'll, I'll impose on him for another video a little bit later, but uh, I appreciate Doug coming out and helping us out and, and always, always, always willing to contribute back to the club and, and help anyone who needs it. So. Doug, you have our heartfelt thanks. Thank Very you. Much. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Doug. Okay. All right. We'll see y'all next week. <laughs>